I'm Gary Edelman with the Civil War Trust, and we're lucky today to be here in the inner sanctum of the Gettysburg National Military Park. And we're here with curator Greg Goodell. Thanks so much for having us here today as we examine uh, some of the items belonging to the United States sharpshooters and try to get insights into their service here at Gettysburg. And I think we should start with their brigade commander, a guy named John Henry Hobart Ward. And we have some of his items out here today. What do we have, Greg? Well, we have a number of Ward's personal effects in the collection. Um, what you see here on the table, there's a sampling of those. Um, most importantly, you've got his Brigadier General shoulder straps with the single star indicating his rank and the dark blue um, black field indicating the staff designation of his assignment. You've got his general officer's uh, gold sash, his sword belt with uh, individual hangers, his, uh, obviously his, his field holster, for this Smith & Wesson revolver and his personal field compass. Um, you'll also note in this portrait, um, if you look very closely in this really well-known studio portrait of Ward, um, he's actually wearing a different belt. Um, you'll see this has three stripes and this has four. So obviously General Ward had several belts that he used for um, dress occasions. Even if he's not wearing this belt here, it looks like it's seen some action. Yeah, it does look like it's got some wear. It probably, again, when general officers are going into the field, they're not always wearing their dress equipment. So, of course, we're going to be um, having some additional pieces that he probably owns for field usage. The holster, if you could take a look at, with its, its well-worn surface and folded over flap like this, this definitely saw some action. There's no question about it. Um, it uh, fits this Smith & Wesson revolver, as you can see. So very strong likelihood that he would have been wearing wearing this holster at least and carrying this pistol here at Gettysburg. It's really cool. So John Henry Hobart Ward actually commands the largest brigade in the Union Army. He's got the most regiments of anyone else in the Union Army with eight. And Ward's rise, you know, would be limited, of course. He's going to run afoul of, of higher command and charges of, of drunkenness um, in 1864. And he will go on to, you know, work, I believe, for the state of New York for a while. He survives all these battles and some 40 years after the Civil War got run over by a train. And that is where John Henry Hobart Ward met his end. But we can still look at some of his stuff here and I think gain some insight. The main action of the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg was initiated by John Henry Hobart Ward's brigade, primarily by his 1st and 2nd U.S. Sharpshooters Regiment. The 1st Regiment was out on Seminary Ridge fighting Wilcox's Alabamians, and the 2nd Regiment was out near the Slider Farm where they initially encountered the entirety of Longstreet's attacking force on the second day. Now, why would these two regiments have such a pivotal role against what is essentially entire brigades and entire divisions of the Confederate Army? It has to do with one thing this rifle and their marksmanship. So Greg, can you talk a little bit about this rifle that's in front of me? Right, uh, sure, sure, Doug. Um, we've got here a uh, double set trigger model 1859 Sharps breech loading rifle. When Hiram Burdain created the first and second regiments of the U.S. Sharpshooters at the beginning of the war, um, he actually went directly to Sharps to add a particular specification to this weapon. And the particular specification that he wanted was to help these men control and maintain their accuracy. And that was the installation of a double set trigger, a hair trigger. So the main trigger here has to be depressed before the hair trigger, which is very sensitive to the touch, will fire the round. What also makes this rifle unique is that it's got further evidence supporting what it is. I have in front of me here uh, a record book. This was actually the record book of Charles W. Seaton, who placed his signature inside the cover here. What makes this record book particularly significant is it shows the issuance of this very rifle in front of us. Very cool. As you can see here, on December, in December of 1862, William J. DeMogg, this is the uh, soldier here at the top, was issued rifle number 57077. You can see that serial number. <laughs> sure enough. Right here. So can we say with 100% certainty that this rifle in front of us was fired on Seminary Ridge on July 2nd, 1863? Without question, we can. 
Right. We've got it here in the record book as being issued in December of 1862. We know William J. DeMogg was here and active as a member of the, of the, of the first U.S. sharpshooters um, during the battle, so we can say without, without a doubt this weapon was used at Gettysburg. At around noon on July 2nd, 1863, the first U.S. sharpshooters under Lieutenant Colonel Casper Trepp advanced to this position here on Seminary Ridge. Behind me is the monument to Company F of the first U.S. sharpshooters, the Vermont Company. And this is the same company that Private William DeMogg was in when he fired the rifle that is now in the collection of Gettysburg National Military Park, the rifle we looked at earlier today. That artifact was brought out to the battlefield right here and was used in combat in fight between the sharpshooters, the 3rd Maine, and Wilcox, Alabama Brigade through these woods behind me. We're still taking a look here at the great United States Sharpshooters collection that they have here at Gettysburg National Military Park. And Greg, I'm really interested in what you have before us. Uh, first off, you have a beautiful hat and there's a great red diamond on top of that. Can you tell us a little bit about what you have here? Sure, absolutely. What you see here actually is a forage cap from a member of the U.S. Sharpshooters. The U.S. Sharpshooters uniform was specified to be a, a green wool and the distinctive red diamond is the core symbol for the first division of the third army corps of which the sharpshooters were a part it's very unique for any kind of sharpshooter headgear to actually survive to the present day um, to have this particular example with the unique core badge is quite special and we also have this beautiful frock coat uh, looks like an enlisted man's frock coat. Um, it's very dark green. It almost looks black where we're standing here. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about both the green that would have been on this frock coat, what tie that has to the United States sharpshooters, and then, then again the buttons. The buttons to me look very dark. They don't look like they'd be your brass shiny ones uh, that you'd see on normal enlisted man's coat. Correct. Well, what you're seeing here is actually a documented frock coat to a member of Company K of the 1st Regiment United States Sharpshooters. His name was William Henderson. When the sharpshooters began to um, be placed into the field, uniform specifications called for green uniforms. The arsenals that supplied the Army of the Potomac ran out of sharpshooter uniforms very quickly. The ones made out of green cloth. So they had to use their best efforts to try to outfit the regiments with the proper clothing. So this example that we see here is actually an example of an overdyed garment. So they would have taken a standard infantry frock coat, dipped that blue frock coat into a vat of green dye to try to get the color to be as close as possible to the regulation green. Specifications for the sharpshooters called for blackened buttons. So the way that the Army came up with the black buttons was to use Goodyear's patented rubber to create buttons that were darkened in color. And would they have issued the corporal stripes like this, or would this be something, again, specially made like the uniform have to be dyed? The, it, from, from what it appears by examining this this part of the uniform. These were probably uh, light blue infantry stripes that were like I described for the coat, dunked in a vat of green dye to try to match the color as close as possible. Which shows that it's that they're such a uh, niche unit that they need to make sure that they have things for them, but they don't need to make it on that large scale like you have for the standardized. If that's correct, that's correct. Much smaller than enough. Well, Greg, this is a fantastic collection that you have here at Gettysburg National Military Park. It's been a great pleasure to see this great coat that we have here, the rifle, and tie those back to soldiers who fought in these crimson fields at Gettysburg. I want to thank you for having us out today to Gettysburg National Military Park to share this handful of your million or so artifacts that you have. And thank you, viewers, for watching us as we had a great day here at Gettysburg.
As the Civil War is coming to a close, President Abraham Lincoln and his wife attend a play at Ford's Theater on April 14th, 1865. During the play, the famous actor John Wilkes Booth gets into the presidential box, shoots the president, and escapes. It results in a massive manhunt. Ordinary people like you and I actually saved artifacts and mementos from those terrible events. This is something people did in the 19th century, and these artifacts were actually cast about across the country and throughout the world. Today, the Civil War Trust is going to track down some of these mementos and artifacts and see some of the things that Abraham Lincoln wore, that he held, and even some of the things on which he spilled his blood on those terrible days. Our journey will take us up to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, but we're going to start here in Washington, D.C., where we're going to speak with Harry Rubenstein, chair and curator of the political division at the National Museum of American History. I'm standing next to Abraham Lincoln's office suit. Um, this is a suit that he had for many years in the White House. You know, the last time he wears it, you know, in many respects, is one of the happiest days in Lincoln's life. You know, victory is in the air. He decides on that day, wearing this suit, to take a carriage ride with Mary Lincoln. And Mary talks about Lincoln as being happier than she remembers him, you know, for many, many years. And they start to talk about their future. And Lincoln says, I want to go to Jerusalem and see the Holy City. I'd love to see the gold mines in the West. And Mary you know, says, I'd like to see the capitals of Europe. And they begin to start planning their futures. And Lincoln turns to, him, to Mary and says, we really need to put you know, the sorrows of the past behind us and think about the future. And let's go to the theater and have a good time. As Abraham Lincoln is getting ready to go to Ford's Theater, he's drinking a cup of coffee, and he leaves this behind on the windowsill. This is the last cup that Abraham Lincoln drank from the night he went to Ford's Theater. The first object that came to the collection was Lincoln's hat in 1867. We're not exactly sure when he purchased it from a Washington hat maker by the name of Davis. And we don't know how often he wore the hat. But we do know that the last time he wore this hat was to go to Ford's Theater. The hat itself was left behind in the presidential box. As soon as the War Department takes over the theater, to sort of preserve it as a crime scene. They take the hat and the chair that he was sitting in back to their offices. And in 1867, it's given to the Smithsonian Institution. Boos comes into the presidential box, shoots the president, stabs the Lincoln gas, jumps onto the stage, and everything explodes into chaos. Laura Keene, the producer and star of Our American Cousin, is allowed to cradle the presidents in her arms. And as that happens, blood from this wound stains her dress and her cuff. As you can see, there's a few blood stains on the cuff. Now we're here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a place connected with Abraham Lincoln, and we're here at the Gettysburg Museum of History with my friend and curator, Eric Dorr. The first thing I brought out today was a, this is an actual piece of towel that was used to stop the blood of Abraham Lincoln. It's very faded, but there is a stain on there, and that is the president's blood. And we know that because we tested the piece chemically. In Abraham Lincoln's day, people were really into relics. You know, they took little pieces of things. There were many hair locks taken um, when, when Lincoln died. I, through my research, I found at least seven what we call copious hair locks, big, thick hair locks. That's ones that were clipped off that night. There's no replicating the color. Um, you see colorized photos of Lincoln, but there it is. Exactly. That's the color of Lincoln's hair, um, at least in his last days. Um, here are in this box, prison hoods from the Lincoln conspirators. And over here, 
are the wrist irons and leg, leg shackles also that the prisoners were forced to wear. You know, you can see they really show the desire for vengeance and punishment of anyone associated with Lincoln's assassination. I, I never quite, in looking at this material, have decided whether it makes the mythic more real or it makes the real more mythic. You can cast yourself back in a time that you can't do in almost any other medium. We hope you enjoyed our exploration of some of the mementos and artifacts associated with Lincoln's last days. The people involved with these events were real, and these artifacts can help remind us of that. Thank you to the Smithsonian, thank you to the Gettysburg Museum of History, and thank you for watching. I'm Doug Ullman with the Civil War Trust War Department, I'm sitting here behind the Dunker Church on the Antietam National Battlefield. I'm here with Gary Edelman of the Civil War Trust and with Keith Snyder, a park ranger here at Antietam National Battlefield. In June of 1862, Robert E. Lee took command of the Army of Northern Virginia. Within three months, he had taken that army from the outskirts of Richmond through Virginia and here into Maryland, where he fought the single bloodiest day in American history. Keith, what can you tell me about General Lee's generalship and sort of how he brought the army here? You have to start with his decisions to enter Maryland, which was a very important decision for the fate of the army and the nation, because this, to make this northern invasion the first one was, was critical to the Confederate war efforts. Lee is really looking big picture, very strategically. You know, he was trying to get the war out of Virginia for a while. That's where most of it had taken place in the early part of the war. Uh, he's looking to keep the momentum from these victories that he had won, particularly most recently at the Second Battle of Manassas. He's looking for support in Maryland, a divided, slave-holding border state. So we really have to start with his decision to enter Maryland and, and, and his goals for this campaign. Now, Gary, Lee is commanding a fairly small army, at least compared to you know, John Pope's Army of Virginia and the, especially combined with the Army of the Potomac. What makes Lee bold to make this movement into Maryland? Well, I think, you know, I think Lee has reason to think he will succeed. I mean, this guy takes command um, in early June of 1862 and all of a sudden pushes the mighty host of the Union away from uh, Richmond, uh, leaves them there boldly, and then strikes off into the north and wins at Cedar Mountain and really wins at Second Manassas as well. So I think even taking into account how many soldiers he lost and thinking he might be able to compensate for those losses by people in Maryland rising up and flocking to his army, something of course that really didn't happen. He was marching through the wrong part of Maryland, it seems to me, <laughs> to accomplish that. I think he felt that his army could do great things, and he didn't have much respect, I think, for the enemy commanders necessarily. Um, he had every reason to believe he would succeed, and uh, had the goods to back it up thus far. Now Keith, does you think uh, Lee has McClellan's number pretty much set at this point? Lee feels that he has the time to do what he, has, he wants to do in Maryland because it will take much longer for the Union Army to reorganize and react. Now all that changes, of course, in September 13th when Special Orders 191 gets found. At what point is Lee aware that McClellan knows his strategy? Here's Lee on this grand campaign. He spreads his army out confidently as if he, McClellan will act as he normally does. And then all of a sudden, McClellan is moving in a way he doesn't expect to. He knows that the Union Army has reacted and has moved to the area. He knows that McClellan has gotten, gotten here much faster than what he anticipated. Whether that's because of Special Order 191 or not, doesn't matter. Lee came here for a battle. He wants a battle. You know, he's convinced that he can defeat the Union Army once and for all. That's it, we're gonna end the war. We're gonna end, end it now. He has that confidence. Maybe a little of that is taken away with the Confederates being driven off South Mountain. You know, the night of the 14th, he was considering returning to Virginia, and then he got news that Harper's Ferry should and would surrender the next day of the 15th, and that's what leads to his decision to stand his ground. What I think leads to what happens here on September 17th, the Army of Northern Virginia is already one of the most confident armies in history. The Union Army that marches to this field after the victory at South Mountain 
has gained great confidence. So what you have here on Wednesday the 17th are two large, very confident, very well equipped armies intent on destroying each other. And that's why September 17th is what it is. Now once the sun comes up on September 17th, which of the two generals really handles the crisis of battle better? Really, the generals have two different leadership styles here. Lee is very actively engaged. He is everywhere. I think that almost every soldier in the Confederate Army saw his boss that day. And that means a lot to the men in the ranks, to see their boss, know that he's there with them. He's, he's experiencing this with them. McClellan is delegating. He is pushing out to the field, to the Corps commanders especially, the tactical management of the battle on the field. In a way, maybe the culture of the commanders actually fit the, the um, the emergencies and the need here. Lee is in a precarious situation. The Union attacks of the 1st and the 12th Corps on the morning of the 17th really uh, started pushing against Lee's left and all of a sudden it's a crisis. The Battle of Antietam is one crisis after another for Robert E. Lee. Um, so he almost needed to be riding around taking most of his army from the right and moving them over to the left just to make sure he didn't meet disaster here. Whereas McClellan with more troops with a grand plan initiating a lot of the offensive was able to stand back and take a more Napoleonic approach. So I think Lee did just what he needed to do, without which it could have been a disastrous day for the Confederacy. I tell you, both of these men, I think, have a sense of, if things go really badly here, either one of their nations are going to cease to exist. If the Union Army in the East right here is defeated badly after losing all summer, this nation, as we know it, ceases to exist. It will be a separate two nations forever. The future fate of both of their countries rests on every decision they make. That's a lot of responsibility. You know, the moral fiber necessary to oh, do wow. these things, not only once, twice, three times, but this, this summer would destroy almost any person. And all these men are in their mid-30s and they have responsibilities, you know, bond anything we can fathom. And also, these officers are thrown from, from pre-war days where you might have commanded a company of 100 men, and now you have an army of 80,000. Even the responsibilities of, say, a Civil War colonel might be much more difficult than we could oh, ever absolutely. fathom, even studying this stuff all the time. No, it, is, it is no surprise that people like this, McClellan included, rose to where they were. They had a certain thing about them that at least allowed them to rise to that level. At least in McClellan's case, did he rise quite enough to the occasion, do you think? I mean, he has to know at a certain point that this is a crisis for Robert E. Lee. What causes this Union failure to really destroy the Confederate Army here? Well, I never thought that was his goal. Lee, every time he fought, he failed because he never destroyed the enemy army. And that was Lee's goal every time. McClellan, to not lose and to push the enemy out of Maryland, that was, I think, his, his stated goal more than anything else. His, but I'm not sure if it's the president's. Because President Lincoln did send the message, destroy the rebel army yes. if possible. Because so, this is something that's been argued about for 150 years, and this will be for the future too. But I ask people, all, who achieves their operational objectives in this campaign? And I would say McClellan does, Lee does not. Mm -hmm. Everything that he wanted to do, McClellan I'm speaking of, the Confederate Army has retreated, uh, Maryland is safe, Pennsylvania is safe, the capital is safe, Lee's objectives, maybe going to Pennsylvania, Maryland rising up. The only thing he really achieved was getting the war out of Virginia for a couple of weeks, and that's about it. So if you step back for a minute, McClellan with all of his faults actually achieves his objectives and Lee does not. And, and I think there's a point in the battle where he's seriously considering and actually does order the 5th Corps to go in, not uh, just a few thousand guys, but most of the Union 5th Corps under Fitz John Porter in. And I think Porter was the one that said, okay, I'm ready to go in, but I'm your last reserve. And McClellan <laughs> said, okay, forget it, or something like that. Isn't, isn't, well, that's partially true. And well, the, I'll the take point, that. The only point I would make to that is, and this is one of the, I don't want to call it a myth of Antietam, is that nothing happened in the middle, which is not true. There yes. are more casualties at the middle bridge than there is at the Burnside Bridge. Wow. Good. People don't have any idea Good. about that. Most of the Burnside Bridge casualties are after, after Burnside the bridge, bridge is taken. Yeah. So at the bridge itself, no, it's not necessarily comparing apples to apples, but I would describe it as a reconnaissance and force in the center. So there is engagement. The Sixth Corps does cross. This idea of, you know, 30, 40,000 men yeah. that all sat on the other, that's not true either. And, and through that lens, the fact that McClellan did send men through the center, that he did have a shot at Cemetery Hill and actually got uh, rebuffed at that point, might have made him more reluctant when the real opportunity presented itself after Burnside Bridge had been yeah, compromised. Yeah. All of that. See, once again, they, they don't know all that information as it's going on. Right. We only know it now. They don't know. That's the hard part. And the other thing on the battlefield, I don't care if you're a general or a colonel or a sergeant or a private, you can see about 10 feet. 
That's about all you know on this field. Look, we can't even see the other side of this Dunker Church. It's a little crest of the hill. We don't know what's a hundred yards that way. And during this battle, there was an entire Union division 200 yards that way, and we would not even know it. We expect these soldiers in their official reports or their post-war writings to know what's going on here when really it's just like, oh, I'm from uh, a state far away from here. I marched up, oh, and then this horrible chaotic event happens right. and then they leave and we expect them to remember. I can barely remember what happened last month sometime. Right, what do we have breakfast this morning? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not just talking about the average private. We're not just talking about some farm boy from North Carolina or from upstate New York. We're talking about the two commanders of the premier armies of their nation. Who rises to the occasion here? Is it the one that achieves the strategic victory and is able to push the the enemy back into its country or is it the the general that's using his smaller force in a bold maneuver and at the end still commands the field that's a tough one i'm saying it's <laughs> yeah. been argued about for 150 years yeah. it's how you interpret it I, i'll tell you a discussion that i've had with the highest level of, the, of our current military i ask them uh, who wins this battle tactically, who wins operationally, and who wins strategically. And the consensus has been over 20 years is that Lee does win here tactically. And it is absolutely because of his personal leadership. No question about it. Operationally, George McClellan achieves his objectives. And strategically, Abraham Lincoln, who we haven't talked about, <laughs> is the great victor there because he takes the boldest step of all and that's emancipation. With all of his stated objectives, how difficult do you think it is for Robert E. Lee to pull back and say, I've got, I've got to go back across the Potomac. The next day he stands his ground. Now, I don't think anybody even knows what's going on where they can make any kind of really informed decision, but I know most of his commanders were probably pushing, let's get out of here, let's get out of here, and Lee, another very bold move, says, no, we're going to stay. I think he took one of the greatest chances of his military career by standing here on the 18th. He has nothing left. Yeah. There, <laughs> I mean, every soldier in his army fought that day. Another one of those myths is how, you know, McClellan cautious, never does anything. He goes after him, which leads to the Battle of Shepherdstown. There is fighting against Lee's retreating army on the 19th and the 20th. Now, it takes a day, and I don't think anybody could have done anything on the 18th. I don't care who you are. Now, it's the 5th Corps that leads the attack at Shepherdstown. Absolutely. What, you know, couldn't McClellan have done something with them on the 18th? No. I don't think anybody <laughs> could have done anything. They don't even know what's happened. I mean, it's been, an, it's been a holocaust, and they have no idea. So we are talking about Lee and McClellan, people who've commanded large armies for a real long time, but this is the largest battle that either of them has ever fought in, and oh. is the second largest battle in American history up to that time, the other one being Shiloh, right? Um, and that was earlier that year, neither of them were there. So this is unprecedented for them as well. No one in this nation has seen anything this bad before or since. And so that certainly has an effect on these men and how they handled it the hours and days after. Thank you very much, Keith, and thank you, Gary. We hope you enjoyed watching. I'm Gary Edelman with the Civil War Trust, and we're here at the West Point Museum, and I'm here with my friend curator Mike McAfee, and we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the characters at Five Forks, two in particular, General Philip Sheridan and General Governor Kemble Warren. Didn't get along as the war went on toward the end. Uh, Warren was not a big favorite of uh, U.S. Grant himself, and Grant had empowered uh, Phil Sheridan to relieve Warren on the spot if he felt it was necessary. Well, they get into the Battle of Five Forks, Sheridan in overall command. Warren's troops actually pierce and get in behind uh, the Confederate position, but he did not please Sheridan, and Sheridan relieved Warren on the spot. Warren spent the rest of his life trying to vindicate um, his actions at Five Forks and otherwise. And here we have some of their actual stuff here, Mike. Right, they have uh, Warren's uniform coat, and then his forage cap, or kepi, and shoulder straps from the 5th New York when he was colonel of the regiment. And then this little piece is uh, Sheridan's. We have a shoulder strap and the core badge that were worn at Appomattox. Very cool. Now, I think you can learn a little bit about lo by looking at this stuff. Um, I, am I correct that these straps and this hat sort of go together, but perhaps the coat doesn't go with this stuff? Uh, well, t partially true. There's a painting that uh, shows Warren and some of his family and father-in-law and things like that uh, picnic on the Hudson River. And in it, he's wearing a coat like this, but he's also wearing that cap. 
Now, the bars, shoulder straps, don't match the kepi in color. Right, that's because these have faded uh, ah. for some reason, either during the war or later. It's interesting that these did and the hat didn't, perhaps the way they yeah. were cared for in the intervening years? That or just the way that they were made. This is a piece of jewelry as much as it is a core badge, of course, with the uh, pennant here, the guidon, is a copy or replica of the Sh Sheridan's own personal guidon. Uh, if you've seen some representations of him charging over the breastworks at Five Forks and such, he's carrying this guidon. Thank you, Mike. These are some very interesting pieces from a very famous event, and thank you for watching.